Hello all, I heard that uh, we didn't get the live stream out uh, and I apologize for that. We are working on it and I know that uh, you may have heard people say that we're working on it. Uh, we really are working on it um, and I will do my best to make sure that that does not happen again. Uh, but I do want to still give you the word. I want to give you the that spiritual nourishment so that you can be on board with where uh, all of us at church are. Um, because God speaks to us as a congregation. Usually he's going to speak through the pastor and the pastor is going to give uh, us a word and together we live that out. So I don't want to leave out any of the people online. You all are as important to me as the in-person. Um, and I, because I'm a, I'm a tech person. I love digital. Uh, I'm this close from taking it over, but... We'll, we'll, we'll hold out hope and, and see if, uh, if we can get everything sorted out. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to figure it out myself and we'll, I'll make sure that that, uh, never, that, it, that it works. Okay, that said, this sermon this week was on fuming and fretting. Um, uh, there's a passage in, in, I believe it was Psalm 37. You could check the bulletin. Now let's see if I, I really remember the teaching. But, uh, it talks about how, you know, we, we shouldn't get angry and we shouldn't, because in our anger, I mean, we, we're going to get angry, right? But there's a passage of scripture that says, in your, in your anger, do not sin, right? You're allowed to get anger, but it's the behavior that comes afterwards. And so today we're going to look at fuming and fretting as uh, that's where we are in our book, um, in, in, in uh, The Power of Positive Thinking. So I'm back from vacation. We went to Carmel, New York. I got to see the Mets play and beat the Yankees. We went to Quasi. It was all very nice. But a few days before the vacation was over, I started to fume and to fret. The word fume means to boil up, be agitated or distraught. Fretting means to whine and whimper. I'd enjoyed my vacation, but now I felt the need to shift gears and I had to open my emails. I had to look at my calendar. I put on the news and I just thought, ugh, what a trap vacation can be. Three days before vacation was over, I decided to trans my, transport myself to the future. I started living three days in the forward, worrying about all that I might be coming back to. I put myself in that state of worry and worry produced fuming, and fretting. Has anyone else had that experience or am I the only person who's ever had that? <laughs> An experience where you just can't enjoy the present moment because you're either lost somewhere else mentally in the past or in the present. Now, I don't use the word fretting and fuming often in my everyday life, but when I looked at the chapter uh, by Norman Vincent Peale in his book, The Power of Positive Thinking, I laughed at the title because it was titled Stop Fuming and Fretting. Of course, of course, Jesus would know that, right? Of course, that's the prompt for this week. And of course, I'm fuming and fretting. And of course, I don't want to hear the truth from Jesus or else I might have to stop fuming and fretting. But your pastor is the guinea pig for the gospel. I have to test it to see if it works before offering you the product. And so I took Norman Vincent Peale at his word and gave his lesson my attention. Attention is key. Where was my attention? It was on all that I was coming back to. It was on all that I needed to catch up on. It was on what? It was on the future. And what had the future caused me to do? It made me speed up my internal pace. I once was asked to do a 5K to which I said, sure. I still think my body is that of a 19 year old and that I needed no prep. To add on to that, I had agreed to wear my priest collar to do the run so that I'd represent the clergy. You see this? You see what being bold and arrogant gets you? It gets you in trouble. Because <laughs> I didn't think this through. In my mind, I was just going to show up and run. Maybe walk if need be. No pressure, right? Well, the person who asked me to do the run showed up and was all excited to run along with me. <laughs> she, unfortunately, was a very skilled runner and now I felt the pressure to keep pace with this lady in my collar in front of the whole town of Greenwich. I haven't run a 5K since. Don't ask me, please. Maybe, maybe you'll get me. That run turned into a miserable day for me because I was running at a pace I could not really do. The next day, I could barely walk. What happened? 
I tried to run along with someone who was much faster than I was. Sometimes we do that with ourselves. Sometimes in our minds, we have this vision of all we want to get done, and it is just outpacing us in real time. And what does that? Our environment. Surely if no one was around, I would have done the 5K at a pace I could have enjoyed. Heck, I may have done 10K. When the environment around us is going faster than us, it pushes us in our minds to drive us even harder, to push us even more, which creates stress, which creates worry, which ultimately produces a certain fretting and fuming. Think of a car. What would you have to do to get it to the point that it was fretting and fuming? At that point, it gets so hot you can't even touch the hood. How many of us are like that when we're caught up having to run a pace that's unsustainable. Don't even come near me. I'm too hot when I'm wrapped up in worry, right? That is the time we live in. Whether it's social media telling me you need to have this done by this time and, or you should be at this place now in your life. Maybe it's your work, maybe it's school, maybe it's your personal life or your social life. But if you feel like you are way ahead of yourself and always finding yourselves fretting and fuming because of worry and stress, Jesus is going to show us a better way. I went to Cardoza High School and it was a big school. My graduating class alone was 4,200 kids. And there was this intersection in the hallways that you couldn't even make your way through sometimes. There, were, there would be so many kids you may have tried to walk across the hall, but you would find yourself either turned around, fully around or going in the, down the wrong hallway because all the people would just be pushing you around in, in the direction that was the most dominant. <laughs> At a certain point, I just decided not to call, not to use that intersection. We called it uh, 42nd Street. I chose another route, which was a bit longer, but more reliable. We can't change the environment of the world to meet our needs. And so what do we do as Christians? What should we do? Change this environment, this environment inside of me. And when I say our environment, I mean our mind, our body, and our spirit, the whole thing. If everyone around us is wrapped up in the world's issues, just on the body, just on the material, then we too might get pulled along with them. Jesus talked about this when he spoke about the narrow road. If everyone is going down the broad road, which leads to, to what? To death. Uh, why death? Because the whole world is focused on what the world is focused on. They think that this is everything. And well, if everybody's going in that direction, that's the Titanic. If the Titanic is sinking and you're on it, you will sink with it. That is the broad road. That's the way of the world. And what Christ is teaching us is that this life is kind of like a school of sorts to work out your spirituality. Just as the body gets sorted out in the mother's womb, we, our whole identity, our full self, gets sorted out in this life. Heaven is made up of people. And the kind of people that God wants mature people. He wants his people to grow up and become mature Christians and stop talking about religion and start living it out. What I've been trying to communicate in this series is applications. What does Jesus' teachings look like in my everyday life? What was Jesus? What was Jesus? He was the word made flesh. We call that incarnation. He came to life. A modern rendering might be, he's the word manifested. The words on the pages have come to life. That is what we're called to be like Christ. Incarnations of his living word. Not just followers. Following is easy. Worshiping is easy. Doing it. Making the incarnation happen by living out the words. That's the magic of this whole religion thing. So how do I stop fuming and fretting so much? Because that, that's what being a Christian would look like, right? Again, this is going to need to become a discipline if it's to be actualized. What were the Christians originally called? Disciples, which means students. Why? Why would you call those people students? See, they, didn't call, they would call themselves disciples, and Jesus called them disciples. He didn't call them Christians. Why? Because life is a school. We are students, and Jesus is our teacher. He's our rabbi. So what did my rabbi, what did my teacher, Jesus, and his lofty words have for me when I started to study them after I got back from vacation? Oh, I had a lot to be worried about. I had a lot to fret and fume over. How did I practice this myself this week? 
Norman Vincent Peale came up with six steps on how to stop fuming and fretting as a practice. Because I tell my kids all the time, stop, stop. That's, I feel like that's all I do. I'm just a lifeguard saying, stop, stop with a whistle. <laughs> But I know as an analyst, as a psychoanalyst, that's not effective because if I really wanted them to stop doing something, I would have to teach them how to control their urges and drives. But guess how kids learn? Through us, through the parents, through adults. We've got to model it first. You know why Christianity is failing? Because the Christians are so worried about everybody else, but they've stopped worrying about their own faith. You got to build your own faith. If if one of us would just light up, how many lights do you need to light a room? The problem is there's no lights on because <laughs> we're all fretting and fuming. So when the urge to fret and fume comes over you or you find yourself just ready to lose it, here's what you can do. If you hear Max in the background, I'm sorry, I'm doing this from home. <laughs> uh, again, so if you feel like you're fretting and fuming and you're just caught up in this cycle and you find yourself ready to lose it, here's what you can do. I'm just going to tell you, your flesh right away is not going to want to do this, okay? That's, you got to understand that. I think there's a scripture that says, my spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The body is weak. It doesn't want to do anything. It wants to stay in bed. It wants to choose the low-hanging fruit. Just ask Adam and Eve. It doesn't want to do all of the work for all of the goodness. So again, your flesh is not going to want to do this. So Christ is going to teach us a lesson. Okay, Here's, here it is. Your spirit can override your flesh, but it needs to be strong enough to do so. That's what church life is for. This is the environment that helps us not get stuck in the traffic of the world. Okay, so it's three days before vacation. I'm wrapped up in fretting and fuming. Basically, I'm a cactus plant. And it's hard to notice at first, but again, I've cultivated a relationship with God so I can't ignore him. I wish I could ignore him sometimes. So in the midst of all of that, I was trying to meditate and I couldn't. I was fretting and fuming too much. There was a part of me that wanted to exclude God from my worry. Like, God, I'll get back to you once I've got it all sorted out. That was my thought. But the worry persisted. The fuming and fretting persisted. And so finally I had it. I sat down to meditate. I pushed myself. It's going to take that sometimes. I put on a meditation I could follow. I went on YouTube and I just let it guide me. I found one that was 15 minutes long because I knew my mind would wrestle. And here's exactly what happened, play by play. First minute in, this is dumb. Why am I sitting down when I have all this work to do? I should be working, not sitting down. Second minute, same thing. Third minute, fine, fine, I'll stay here. The whole time I'm challenging myself to focus on the breath I take in through my nose and out through my nose. Just like that. Fourth minute. Thoughts are invading. I start to get agitated. I can't stop them. Fifth minute. By now, everything has crossed my mind. Sixth minute. I stopped fighting and accepted that this is just what I'm going to do. Seventh minute. Peace. Eighth minute. Peace. Ninth minute. Peace. Tenth minute. Peace. Eleventh minute. Peace. Twelfth minute. Fifteen. Fourteen. Uh, Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Minute. Peace. Peace. I opened my eyes slowly. Peace. Where was I 15 minutes before that? In conflict. What happened? I overrode my flesh. With each minute that passed, my flesh wrestled against me and finally gave in. That is what we need to have happen. The flesh must submit to the spirit. That's why Paul said the mystery of Christ is like marriage. Do you think I'm a good person because of just me? No, it's because I live with my wife who's challenged me to change and grow into my full self. Do you think my kids are wonderful? We had to shape that. I have to submit to my wife's needs and marriage has done that. It shaped me and I'm sure I've shaped her. My kids have to submit to our house rules and it does what? It shapes them. How can we expect to be changed and shaped if we don't spend time with the one who changes and shapes us? How can you learn about a subject without study and practice? How can you run a full 5K with no prep in a clergy collar? You need to practice. You need to make it a discipline. And you need someone alongside you who will go at a pace you can handle. Do you know who that person Do you know Jesus? More than, more than forgiveness, more than grace, more than anything else, do you know what Jesus gave us? 
the Holy Spirit. She's going to run alongside with us, making a pace that we can handle. That scripture, he won't give you more than you can handle, is absolutely based on that. But sometimes we push God out and we go at a pace that we can't handle. It's us doing it. So I had my own way of transforming my own my inner world to find peace that would override all that my flesh was consumed with. But I wanted to offer Norman Vincent Peale's six-step process, which, you know, you can do this at home. You could do this uh, in the office, wherever, in your car. Don't do it while you're driving. <laughs> one. He, so th these are the six steps. The first one is find a relaxed place to be and slowly acknowledge all the parts of your body. If you don't want to focus on the breath, you just close your eyes and, and you, here's a way of kind of wrestling your body into submission. There's my, there's my feet. There's my ankle. There's my, my calf. Right? All the thoughts that want to invade and disrupt it, you're going to override by just playing this little program where you're going to say, no, I'm in charge. We're going to focus on what I'm focusing on. So that's the first step. And you just want to relax in this. The next step is you want to think of your mind as the surface of a lake in a storm, waves and all. So picture it. But after a few moments, imagine it, it has subsided and the lake is now calm, the water like glass. Okay? So now upon that glassy water, start imagining your favorite, most beautiful and meaningful scenes that you've ever experienced in your life. Maybe it's a mountain or a sunset, a deep valley. Maybe it's a hammock in the backyard. Maybe it's a walk that you take every now and then. But just calm. This is a moment of calm where you're just noticing and meditating upon the images that you're casting. See, who's in control? You. You're casting. You're creating an environment within yourself. Next step. You say words like this tranquility, serenity, quietness. And you just repeat them over and over. You can make up, you could find your own word, um, but you gotta say it like you mean it. Don't say serenity like uh, George Costanza's father, okay? <laughs> and you repeat them over for a minute or two. Then you make a mental list of all the times that you, you've been in this state of fretting and fuming, of worrying and, and reacting. And I want you to do this. Remember that God has gotten you this far. Do you think God is suddenly going to abandon you now? No, no. He's just working out your salvation so that you mature. Lastly, to seal up the whole ritual and remember it throughout the day, read a scripture on peace. Go on Google and type in scriptures on peace. You'll find a ton of them. Here's one of them. It's from Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why am I always talking about meditation? Because you have to control yourself. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And this is a practice that reminds us that when I'm losing it, I'm going to put myself in the hands of God rather than the hands of my own uh, ego who's going to try to resolve things through fretting and fuming. So you can use that scripture. Or you could seek out your own. And when you find them, you save them like little trinkets. Who needs a fortune cookie? You write your own fortunes. When you write it down, you put it in your in your pocket, and you carry it around, and you remember that passage throughout the day. And it will remind you of the whole ritual you did with the lake and calming down and uh, resolving the, the inner turmoil within so that you can find that peace and stop fretting and fuming. And anytime you lose yourself, you'll have that scripture. That'll be for you. You did it. So this week, I'm not just telling you stop fretting and fuming. I'm telling you there's another way to live. And that, that is the essence of the gospel. That's the essence of what Jesus is trying to teach, that there's another way to live. To find it, you'll need to practice it. It's open to everybody. The reason you don't see it happening is because nobody's practicing it. Instead, a lot of Christians think Jesus is going to come down and do it for them. That's not his MO. So let us work together in our daily lives. And next Sunday, we're going to come back, not as us, but as a, another chapter written in the Bible that is who we are, because we are the written word made flesh, just like Jesus. We're the living testimonies of the God that is still working to this very day. Amen.